Have you ever heard a pro musician absolutely nailing the changes? Everything they play sounds buttery smooth and thought to yourself, how are they doing that? If so, then I have got some great news for you. In this tutorial, I am going to show you step by step how to master playing in between changes. I'm going to give you a step by step guide of what to practice and how to practice it so that you can very easily and smoothly transition in between chord changes just like the pro players. And what makes it even better is there is a free PDF download. So make sure you download the PDF. I have the link in the description below. Get that PDF so that you can follow along. If we're going to learn how to nail some chord changes, then we need a set of chord changes to work on. So for this tutorial, we are going to work on the first four measures of the jazz standard autumn leaves. We are going to do it in the key of E minor, which is one of the keys that that song is often played in on the alto sax. Of course, that would be a G minor concert, but I'm going to be playing the alto sax today. So I'll be talking in the alto sax key of E minor. So let's take a look at these first four chords. We start off with an A minor seven, then we go to a D seven, then a G major seven, and then a C major seven. So the very first thing we're going to do is analyze how these chords are related. Chords are never random. So we need to figure out how they're related. And the easiest thing to do is look for some clues. The first clue that we're going to look for is a major seven chord. We have two of them. So let's look at the first one, which is a G major seven. If we look at the two chords before that G major seven, we can see that there is a minor seven chord followed by a dominant seventh chord leading to this G major seven chord. Whenever you have a minor seven chord going to a dominant seventh chord, going to a major seventh chord, there's a very good chance that it is a two, five, one. And that is exactly what this is. We have A minor seven, which is the two of G. We have D seven, which is the five of G. And then we have the G major seven, which of course is the one of G. Now, after that two, five, one, we have another major chord. And oftentimes when you have two major chords in a row, the second major chord is the four chord. And if we start on G and count to four, G, A, B, C, we have that C major seven. That is exactly what that is. So the analyzation for this first four measures of the chord progression to autumn leaves is a two, five, one in G followed by a four chord. The four chord usually transitions someplace else, and that's exactly what this does. If you looked at the next four chords, you would see that we transition to E minor, which is the key that this song is in. The first four measures are in the relative major. The relative major is the major key that has the same key signature as the minor key. So E minor and G major have the same key signature of one sharp. What are some of your biggest struggles when it comes to improvising over chord changes? Let me know in the comments below. And if I get a lot of the same answers, I'll definitely do some tutorials on that subject. Okay, now we've analyzed the chords. Let's move on to step number two, and that is to play the roots. So the roots are going to really get the chord movement into our ears. So we're just going to put on a backing track or even without a backing track and play the roots. Now I have it written out as whole notes, but I would suggest to do it as a rhythm. So come up with a rhythm so that it has kind of the improv feel to it when you are playing the roots. The whole idea behind this is just to get the chord movements in your ears. Now that you've got the roots and the chord movement in your ears, let's add some more information. So the thing about the root is it's very important because it's the root, but it doesn't give a whole bunch of information except for the root. And we have all different qualities of chords, all different kinds of chords, and the root doesn't change no matter what the quality of the chord is. So roots don't give us any extra information except what note the chord is starting on, what the root of the chord is. So your next step is going to be to do the exact same thing, but this time play one and three. So firsts and thirds. Thirds give us a lot of information. That can tell us whether it's a major type chord, like a major seven chord or a dominant seventh chord, or a minor type chord. So when you add the third in there, it's going to give you a lot more context and a lot more information about what's going on. 
So I'm gonna do another playing example where I just play the root and the third, just so I can get the sound of these chords in my ears a little bit better before we move on to the more difficult steps. If you haven't already, make sure you download the free PDF. The next step is super important, and that is to play chord outlines. Chord outlines are really important because it gets the sound of the entire chord in your ears. It helps you figure out what the transitions are. It helps you move from chord to chord. Because oftentimes, you are gonna be playing in tonal centers, meaning that chords are gonna be working together in one key signature, and that's exactly what's happening here. All of these chords are kind of working around G major for these first four chords that we're playing. So all of the notes and all of the scales for the first four chords are the same notes. G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, G. We just have different chords or different chord tones in each of the chords. So you want to make sure that you are doing chord outlines so that you can get that sound of the chord movement in your ears. Because again, all the scales have the same notes. A Dorian minor has an F sharp, D7 has an F sharp, G major 7 has an F sharp, C major 7, the Lydian degree, also has an F sharp. So the way you're going to hear this chord movement is to really bring out the chord tones. The way to get the chord tones in your ears is to play chord outlines. So far, we've worked through four steps, and these are very important steps, but after you've done this over a couple different sets of chord changes, it gets a lot easier, and you will move through these steps very fast. So in the beginning, if you haven't done this, this might sound like a lot of work, but by the time you've done this over three or four songs, you'll be able to knock the first four steps out very, very quickly. So they're really important, but the more you do them, the easier they get. Step number five is where the magic starts to happen. And step number five, we're gonna take the chord outline that we just did and turn it into a solo. So we're gonna play chord outline solos. All that means is you're gonna improvise a solo, but you're only gonna use chord tones. So for the A minor seven, you're gonna use A, C, E, and G. You can mix them up in any order and repeat them, but those are your four notes. Then when you hit D7, you'll use D, F sharp, A, and C. Again, you can mix them up and jump all over the chord tones, but you wanna make sure you're only using those four notes over the D7. Then when you hit the G major seven, G, B, D, F sharp, and then the same thing for the C major seven, C, E, G, B. So you're gonna be playing an improvised solo only using chord tones, which means you can jump around in the chords and repeat notes. And one of the things that you're gonna to start to notice is that when you transition between certain chord tones, sometimes it's gonna sound a lot better than others. Sometimes it's gonna be buttery smooth, and sometimes it's gonna feel like you're kinda of jumping all over the place. The more you get used to those sounds and you start to pick up on the ones that are smooth, the better your solos are gonna sound and the easier it's gonna be for you to nail the chord changes. Here's an example of me playing a chord outline solo. Now I just did that example with a backing track, but I would suggest when you practice it, do it without a backing track and just keep repeating those four chords and play it over and over and get really comfortable with transitioning from one chord to the next. Once you're really comfortable with it, feel free to put on a backing track if you want, but the bulk of your practice should just be going from chord to chord without a track. Maybe put on a metronome if you wanna really lock in your time and getting really comfortable moving from chord to chord. Because the more you practice this, the more you're gonna start to hear the magic where all of this stuff starts to flow effortlessly you're gonna realize pretty quickly that some chord tones transition to other chord tones and sound a lot better. Some are way more smooth than others. So the more you work on this, the more you're gonna hear that sound and start to figure out what makes the transition sound more smooth. If you're watching the tutorial about nailing the chord changes, then I'm guessing that you'd like to get a whole lot better at improvisation. If that's the case, then I'd like to invite you to come check me out at the Scott Paddock Sax School. 
and my sax school, I have several courses dedicated to improv. They start off at the very, very beginning and take you through early advanced where you will be improvising over complex chord changes. Along the way, I'll teach you how to make things up from scratch, how to turn scales into solos, how to read chord symbols, how to analyze chord symbols, how to break the rules so that your solos sound interesting and just get you a really, really solid foundation when it comes to improvisation. So if that sounds like something you're looking for, then stop by the Scott Paddock Sax School. I'll put the link in the video description below. So this brings us to the secret sauce of voice leading. This is why pro musicians sound so good when they are soloing, even though they might be using the same notes that you are, they are transitioning from chord to chord in a way that sounds really smooth and makes their solos flow really, really well. So when it comes to voice leading, all we're talking about is transitioning from one note and one chord to the next note in the next chord. So we're transitioning from one chord to the next. Let's talk about a couple rules when it comes to voice leading. First, we're going to talk about the chord tones. So we've already talked about the one not being a super important note when it comes to giving us a lot of information. When we're transitioning from one chord to the next, when we're doing voice leading, we want information. We want the information about what type of chord we're playing, transitioning into the next type of chord that we're playing. And the root isn't going to give us a ton of information. So the root isn't your best bet. Now, the same thing is true with the fifth. The fifth gives us a little bit more, but when we have a major chord, a dominant seventh chord, and a minor chord, they all have the same fifth. So if we had A major, A dominant seventh, or an A minor chord, they all have E as the fifth. So the fifth doesn't really give us a lot of information either. The first and the fifth are usually not going to be your first choices when it comes to voice leading. Now, this doesn't mean that you're never going to voice lead to a first or fifth. It just means if you want some more uh, information and you want the transition to sound really smooth, those might not be your best choices. So the magical intervals that give us a lot of information are the third and the seventh. They give us the quality and flavor of the chord that we're playing. They change depending on what type of chord you're playing, if you're playing a major chord or a minor chord. So if you can transition from a third to a seventh or a seventh to a third, you're gonna have really smooth voice leading. So your first voice leading rule is all of the notes are not equal. The third and the seventh give you more information. So you wanna kind of lean on them a little bit more. That doesn't mean that you're never gonna use a root or a fifth. It just means when you have a third or seventh that you can use, you might want to think about using that one first. The second rule is you want to transition by a small interval, a half step when possible. Now, there's something that is very important about the information I'm giving you. This is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to voice leading. There are all different kinds of concepts and there's so many different ways you can approach this, but this is a really great starting point. Think about your thirds and sevenths transitioning to the next chord by a half step. When you do that, it's gonna make everything you play sound really smooth. Now, does that mean that you always have to transition like this? You always have to use the thirds and sevenths and the half step? No, if you do that every time on every chord, it's just gonna to sound too predictable. But if you, if you sprinkle it throughout your solo, your solo is gonna sound really smooth and weave its way through these chords all over the place. It's gonna sound really good. So I would suggest analyzing your voice leading. Again, this is one of those things that in the beginning is very tedious and it takes a while, but after you've done it on three or four songs and you really look at how the chords are going together, it gets quicker and easier, and eventually you're just gonna start to see it when you are improvising. And especially when you work on chord outline solos, it's just gonna start to automatically happen because once you start to hear those uh, transitions by half step, they just automatically will fall out of your saxophone after you've worked on it for a while. For this last example, I'm gonna plug the scales into the chords and then use voice leading. And you're gonna hear how smooth and effortless these transitions sound. As you can hear, that sounds super smooth, super buttery. You can hear all of the chords and you can hear them effortlessly transition from one to the next. And that is the step-by-step -step method that I like to use when it comes to 
teaching, learning, and working through chord progressions. If you enjoy my YouTube content, I would really appreciate it if you give me a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, and click the bell for notifications. Thanks for taking the time to check out this video. If you'd like to dive deeper into my saxophone world, come check me out at the Scott Paddock Sax School. Thank you.